She has won five Olympic medals, four of them gold. She is the fastest woman in the world in the 400 meters. And after retiring in 2016, she wrote a book. It's called Chasing Grace, What the Quarter Mile Has Taught Me About God and Life. And there's also a children's version called Run With Me. Sonia Richards-Ross is here, and congratulations. You are seven months pregnant, <laughs> which you me. couldn't even tell, actually, <laughs> Thank because you. you are in such great shape still. You. Um, you write in this book a lot of very interesting things. One is leaving the island of Jamaica when yeah. you were about 12 years old, yeah. thought that there were maybe scholarship opportunities right. uh, in the United States, in Florida, where you mm -hmm. ended up settling down. You mentioned that... The Jamaican mentality on sports, especially yeah. track, yeah. is that the second place finisher is the first loser. Yeah. And that in the United States, it's more a participation trophy yes. kind of uh, culture. How right. did that impact you at a young age? Yo, yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Meg. Sure. I'm super excited to be here. And yeah, I was born in Kingston, Jamaica. Track and field was the most popular sport, still is the most popular sport. So it's absolutely all around me. And I remember as early as seven years old wanting to be in the Olympics. and. You know, it's funny, I think every culture is different. And the Jamaican culture for sure has a mentality, especially when they believe you are the best, like that if you don't win, it's a huge disappointment. And, you know, I'll never forget when I moved to the States and I was at my first track meet and I was watching like the two mile run and this young girl had been lapped and she was coming around by herself and everyone in the stands stood up and, and clapped. And I was like, she's getting dead last. Like. You know, but I think that balance really helped me. I think being in Jamaica and really always wanting to win was a good thing, but I also needed to find that balance about, you know, sometimes you just give your best and that's good enough too. So I, I always say I got the best of both worlds, but the Jamaican culture is pretty strong about the, their champions. <laughs> it's really interesting and fascinating. If you're being honest with yourself, if you are trying to be an elite athlete, yeah. gold medal, yeah. I mean, do you need more of that Jamaican mentality where second place is the first loser? Yeah, I think so. I think especially while you're training. And I also think too, I mean, there's definitely a thin line between being arrogant and being confident, right? But I think that it's important for you to have that kind of confidence. Like running is mono -y mono. It's like it's like boxing. Like you gotta believe you can win it because if you don't believe you're gonna go out there, you're never gonna perform to your potential. So I definitely think that mentality helped me a lot. And I saw myself as a champion for almost all of my life. And I think that played a big role in why I was actually able to achieve it. Sometimes people criticize the American culture, you know, this participation trophy yeah. culture. Have you noticed it's taken a toll on U.S. track and field athletes through the years? You know, Meg, that's a good question. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that there is, I think the American, especially in the sprints, the part that I was a big part of for so long, everyone wanted to win. I don't, I don't feel like that idea of just participating or we're just at the Olympics has ever been a mentality that I experienced on Team USA track and field. I think the most elite athletes understood like, you know, I want to get that gold medal. I want to win for Team USA. So I don't think it, it hurts the elite athletes. I don't know if sometimes it takes a drive out of those mediocre athletes, you know, who um, could be better, but are satisfied because they are getting a ribbon or are getting cheered on. Maybe they would have been better. Maybe they would push harder. But for sure, the elite athletes, there's something in you that it doesn't really matter the culture. You're going to go for that number one spot no matter what. No doubt. Um, there is a 12-year-old Jamaican girl right now, Brianna Liston. I don't know if you are familiar with her. She ran the 200 meters in 23.72 seconds. That's one and a half seconds off the world record and wow. Olympic record. She's 12. She's wow. drawing comparisons to Usain Bolt. Wow. If you were her, would you lean into those comparisons or would you try to tune them out? It's a really good question. I would try to tune them out. You know, I think that when you're that young and showing that much potential, you see, I grew up in a different time and I, it's crazy to say that, right? I'm 30 and years so old, young. you know, but now there's just with the social media, I feel like there's heightened pressure put on young athletes. And so if she can as much as possible, I try to block that out because expectations and the weight on your shoulders to compete just gets heavier and heavier. And I can only imagine if she starts leaning into that at 12, what is it going to feel like at 18 and 19 when everyone feels like you're still falling a little bit short of where they thought you should be? So I hope that she continues to have fun, um, continues to work hard. But the moment it becomes work, then it's no longer um, it's harder for you to excel. So that's awesome, though. That, those are great times for a 12 year old. Oh, my God. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And you write about expectations in your yeah. book. I think she would get a lot from that. But speaking of Usain Bolt it's possible that one of his medals may get taken away right. because a member of his relay team may have tested positive 
for performance enhancing drugs that's right. still being adjudicated in the courts. Right. You won three of your gold medals by relay. Yeah. Can you put yourself in Usain Bolt's shoes? If you had one of your medals taken away because of a teammate, how would you be feeling? It sucks, <laughs> you know? It really sucks yeah. when you work really hard, you go out there, you do things the right way, and you have the medal at home, and you just, you know, think that you've secured it because on that day you guys won. It's really hard when something that you have no control of, you have no control of what your teammates do. A lot of times people don't realize it, but in track and field you train by yourself, like you have your own coach, and then you become a part of this team for the Olympics, but they're not your training part partners most of the time. You have no idea what they're doing. So it's a very vulnerable position to be in, and there's a lot of trust there that you have to have with your teammates. So it's really disappointing um, for him because I know he has those nine gold medals, and it was just amazing to see him win that third one in Rio, uh, the third of the three that he was going for in Rio, of course. So it would, it would suck. I mean, it's not going to taint his legacy at all. I mean, he'd still be one of the best of all times, but it's definitely going to be unfortunate. Yeah, and of course, we don't see all the training that goes into yeah. it. I'm sure every medal you have, whether it's gold or any other color, yeah. you absolutely cherish. Um, one of the gold medals that you won in a relay was 2008, and yeah. you reveal in this book that you had an abortion two weeks before that yeah. Olympic Games. Yeah. Why did you want to reveal that very personal moment in the book? Well, um, it was after a lot of prayer, and I included that story. It was the last chapter added to my book. But I think a lot of times people see us, you know, you see us at the Olympics, you might see us once every four years, and, you know, people see this like almost like a perfect picture. And for some people, it seems either unattainable or unreal. And so I wanted to be as transparent as I could because I really want this book to be something that people can read and be inspired by and feel connected to. And so the truth is, it's an issue that's not really talked about, especially in sports. And a lot of young women have experienced this. Like, I literally don't know another female track and field athlete who hasn't had an abortion. And that's sad. And so for me, I'm hoping that this will open up some discussions to helping especially a lot, lot of young women who were in my situation not experience what I did. Why do you think it's so pervasive? You said you do not yeah. know another female track athlete yeah. who hasn't had an abortion. I think because at that time in your life, when you're in college, you know, you don't feel comfortable talking to your mom. And so a lot of the, the information you get are from your peers. And I mean, it's going to sound silly to some people, but, you know, like in our community, people don't want to take the pill because you put water weight on. And of course, as an athlete, you want to be able to stay as fit and as healthy as possible. And then people tell you, well, when you're, when you're extremely fit, you can't get pregnant because our cycles are shorter. So there's a lot of miseducation that happens to young women in college because we're educating ourselves. And so I didn't know all of my options, and I had been fortunate up until that point. My husband and I had been dating for five years. I was engaged to him. I had no, no mishaps prior. And so I was just put in a really, really, really tough situation. And, you know, for me, it was so much more than the physical. I mean, of course, you can imagine after the procedure, I wasn't even supposed to run. The doctors told me take 14 days off. I didn't have 14 days. But it was more for me about the spiritual and emotional part of the experience that I wanted to share because it wasn't until even I started this journey that I uncovered some of the hurt that was still there and, you know, and really trying to forgive myself. I knew that God had forgiven me for it, but really forgiving myself for that choice and really moving on. And now that I'm going to be a mother and now that God has blessed me again, I felt like I needed to kind of purge myself of that and hopefully help others do the same. You mentioned also that, you know, your husband, Aaron Ross, who played in the NFL as a yeah. Super Bowl champion, that he was in training camp at the time. So you had to go through this yeah. alone yeah. and it still put a strain on your marriage. Yeah. How'd you guys get through that? Well, you know, so what ended up happening was when I called him, because he was in, in Albany at training camp, you know, I could feel the hurt in his voice. And I mean, he was there for me as much as he could be, but it was something that we kind of never talked about. It was almost like, if we don't talk about it, it didn't happen. And so my mom came with me and um, I'm emotional talking about it now, but you know, but it, it, for, for so much of my relationship, I felt like I experienced it by myself. And so when Ross and I finally like dealt with it, you know, I, f I was able to see his hurt, you know, and he thought for a long time, maybe we were being punished because we didn't, hadn't gotten pregnant again. And, you know, a lot of times, sometimes you believe those lies when you, you know, make poor choices and you want to live your life a certain way. And so it was really freeing for both of us when we said, you know what, God, we really want you to take this away from us and we are sorry for making this poor choice and it brought us closer together um, but there was definitely something always kind of underlying that we needed to address and I'm really grateful that we did yeah and you really you write about it so eloquently in the Thank book you. and you also write about you know 
you guys look like this perfect power couple. You're both elite <laughs> athletes, Super Bowl champion and college football champion. Yeah. Also, Aaron won one at Texas. You're a multi-time gold medalist, but you still went through the insecurities of being an NFL wife. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I started dating my husband, I'll never forget, like, we had just started dating. Like, my husband and I kind of got together like a whirlwind. Like, we started dating, and we were inseparable, like, after the first week. And I remember one of the girls on the track team told me, like, if it was, like, probably in the first two months, um, I saw a girl driving Aaron's car. And, of course, I confronted him, like, I mean, we were barely dating at the time. And he was like, Sonia, I was at your house with the car out front. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, but those little things. It was things, you in the car. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, and so those were always, I think, along the way, just like, you know, little things that would come up that make you feel insecure about your relationship. And even my husband would be in, the, you know, in training camps or at games, and I'd be overseas. I wouldn't even be in the same country as my husband. And so I'm really happy we didn't date during the social media era because I think people are very mean and they might have tried to do things to to tear us apart. But my husband never did anything himself to make me feel like he didn't love me and cherish me. It was just always sometimes my own thoughts. Like I would see women would be at training camp with their phone numbers and like call me like to any guy, you know, and it was just a lot dealing with that when he first went pro. But um like I said, he's a wonderful guy, and he always made me feel good about it. And I had to get past my own insecurities and say, my mom always told me, look, he's a catch, but you're a catch, too. I love you know? that line. It's my favorite line <laughs> in your book, actually. I was just going to mention it. Yeah. Did you ever doubt, though, your own career aspirations because of Aaron's football career? It's a good question, Megan. I think especially, my, like, the great thing about my family and my dynamic, my mom and dad always encouraged me to strive for excellence. But it was funny, it was like more of our grandparents, like the older generation that was like, why are you doing that? Like your husband's making enough money for both of you. You know, you need to be home cooking and doing all of these things. And sometimes I wondered like, you know, do I need to be there supporting him more? Does he need that from his wife or fiance? But to be honest with you, I always felt most fulfilled. I felt like my best self, which I think is the best spouse and best fiance that you can be when I was pursuing my dreams as well. And my husband never ever asked me to hold back or he always supported me which helped me a lot too but there were always like little murmurs of like you know you're doing too much and your husband's gonna step out because you're not home um but thank god he never did that no no he of course not <laughs> and now you guys are going to be raising a son yeah so the big question is probably going to be football or track right? i'm gonna have to make that decision <laughs> for a while but there is a conversation about football mm -hmm. and how early right young boys should be playing football. Right. Have you guys talked about this and have you come to any conclusion? Um, you know, not not very seriously, but my husband didn't start playing until he was a junior in, in high school. So not because his, you know, that his parents held him out because they knew about, you know, head injuries or anything like that, just because it happened that way. And he still had a very successful career. So, you know, he and I, like we, like I said, we haven't really like, okay, babe, what's the plan? Because we're definitely premature in that. If We don't even know if he's going to want to play football or like mm -hmm. football. But if he does, I think we will probably keep him out for a little bit and have him run track, play soccer, other things like that if he wants to be involved in sports. But, yeah, I, I don't think it really matters when they get started if they're already, you know, showing they're being physical and athletic I think they can pick up football at any time okay and what about Aaron himself I mean he wasn't a lineman he was right. a corner right. but still I mean we know now so much about the impact of football on head injuries yeah do you guys talk about it I'm not really Ross was very fortunate he had one really bad concussion while he was in playing um, and we're grateful he's like totally normal like you know he <laughs> lives his life very healthy and so he personally didn't deal with anything thank God like you said not a running back or a line alignment that was always you know having to be hit so I'm very grateful that he walked away in that way unscathed he had some other injuries and stuff like you know his Achilles and which still bothers him like an old man but other than that <laughs> he's good <laughs> well I know you won't now because you are pregnant but you did a thousand sit-ups a day yeah. for years decades oh, yeah. decades yeah far down the road yeah. is it going to be like mom and dad and child all right. doing thousand sit sit-ups a day <laughs> So I started doing a thousand sit-ups when I was 16 years old, when my dad kind of challenged me and asked if I wanted to be great. 
and it was a commitment to excellence. So I think in the same way, like Ross and I always talk about, it's going to be our kids' choice. Like if they want, we're going to support them. I'm going to give them the resources, tell them what I did. I'm not going to be on the floor doing those thousand sit-ups <laughs> with him. I will be watching TV, my feet up. I already did my work. You put your time <laughs> I in. I put my time you put in. Your time. Final one for you. I just had Chris Johnson interviewing yeah. him recently. And uh, for so long, he held the record for the 40 time for all NFL right. players at the Combine. Right. It was recently broken. Yes. He said people used to challenge him to races all the time. You raced a cheetah, Usain Bolt. Right. They tried to race. Right. John Rondo had yes. wanted to race him. Did you get those kind of offers? <laughs> That's funny. I do remember once being, there was some new show coming out and they wanted me to come race some animal, but it didn't work with my schedule. I would have done it because I was curious too. Like, am I faster? Do you but, remember what the animal was? Was it like a cheetah or a leopard? It must have been something like that, <laughs> but I don't remember because it didn't go really far because I was going to be in Europe competing and I'm, they had said it to my mom and it was really funny, but... No, what I always get is if I could race my husband and who would win that race. And we never did that. But maybe in retirement we should. That would be funny. <laughs> I like it with maybe the little kid referee right? at the end. <laughs> That's uh, right. <laughs> congratulations on this book, Chasing Grace, and also the children's version. It's just fantastic. Thanks, Son Richard Doss. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.